This is Dan Bolin, and I'm the host of the program, The Courage to be Courageous, where people come from all walks of life all over the world to share their stories, how they've used courage to overcome their fear. And I want to thank all my listeners uh, worldwide who are connecting with me on my podcast. As many of you know, that it goes out to 30 media networks worldwide. And there's some really powerful stories and very interesting stories as well. I'm really encouraged to interview this gentleman today. Um, this, to me, is really a display of outstanding courage. Outstanding courage. Now, when we did the prelude with this, with David, I'm going to introduce him in a minute, it brought every type of emotions to me. A tremendous amount of courage on his part, but it also brought anger and frustration to me to see what he had to go through as a child. Um, so this is going to be, I, I think you're going to find it, um, you're going to find all different types of emotions that will come out with you. Um, when I did this with David, I had, I had tears because I was able to relate because I had a similar situation in my own family. So I was able to really understand that. And I want to really invite Tavit here to, this is the first time he has ever shared his story publicly. So we owe him a tremendous amount of courage of overcoming his fear. And I believe it will give all of us an understanding and more power and more voice to make sure what happened to Tavit does not happen to our children as well. So Tavit... Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm not even going to try your last name because I practice it, but I'm going to do my best, and then you're going to correct me on it. Kazen Jian. That was excellent. Oh, thank good. You. <laughs> <laughs> Tavit, welcome so much to our program. Uh, you are you're an amazing person and a tremendous amount of courage, and we're going to get into your story. But tell us a little bit of background, where you were raised, uh, your parents are uh, from different, I guess you'd say different areas. Give me some history of your parents and your family. Yeah, first, thank you for having me on. Um, so a little quick background of, for me is I'm born and raised here in Arizona, actually. I'm first generation Arizona, first generation United States. My parents were born in Syria. Um, my, I think they both moved when they were in their, their early to mid-teens to the United States to New Jersey, to be specific, and that's actually where they met. Uh, but they were both from Syria. My mother is Arabic, and my father is, um, my, my mother is Arabic and Greek, my father is Armenian. So do you speak all languages of, of the two, and English so, as well? I, at home, when we were younger, we weren't allowed to speak English. Oh, I um, see. We spoke okay. Arabic and Armenian. So I spoke the two languages when I was younger. I learned English as I, as I started elementary school. And then as I got older, I lost both languages. I retaught myself Arabic at about 16. And Armenian, I pick up quickly when I'm around my family. But um, not a lot of my family members here speak Armenian to us now because so many of the kids only speak English. Oh. But I speak English, Arabic, and a little bit of Armenian. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your family, brothers and sisters, and, and um, when your family noticed you were, I use the word different, that you were not the normal as they thought it should be. Tell us a little bit about that. Your brothers and sisters and when they realized you were different. Yes, Dan. So I have two older sisters. I'm the youngest of three. Um, my oldest sister, Maggie, uh, is about nine years older than I am. And I have a sister in between the two of us named Sarah. I feel like... Um, I was probably about eight or nine when it was actually my oldest sister, Maggie's boyfriend at the time, had approached my family, unbeknownst to me, and informed them, you know, I think your son might be gay. Um, I only found that out years later, but my mom, my dad, my sister, they all, no, can't be, you know, he's just a little effeminate. He's not gay. That was probably the very first time that my parents had an inkling that there was something different about me. Um, how, how did he know you were different or he used the term gay? How did he know? Did he pick up on 
just your effeminate qualities? Is that what it was? I was much more physically effeminate okay. as a child than I am now. Mm -hmm. um, the way I would stand, talk, walk, um, some of the things I was interested in. I wasn't, I wasn't really interested in sports so much. Um, I had a, I had a, a knack for fashion when I was younger. So I would wear my mom's heels and <laughs> I used to, I used to walk through her closet and just feel the different fabrics, um, her clothing closet and things like that, that, you know, typical straight young boys don't do. <laughs> yes. So, so David, when did you realize yourself personally that you were gay or different? Was that at the first time that this gentleman approached you? Did you think you were different then? Or were you doing some self-denial at that time? I wouldn't say denial, Dan. I didn't know um, that I was different until a, a family member, specifically a cousin of mine, also a male, a year older than I was, came to visit from out of, out of state. And <clears throat> we were all just having a good time at the mall. And I... I was caught, quote unquote, caught by my older cousin looking at um, a funny card that had, you know, a very buff, half naked man on the front, shirtless. And his reaction to me was, what are you doing? Put that away. That's gross. You know, you don't you're not supposed to see, stare at that. That's a guy. Are you gay? Hmm. It was the first time I heard that term. Um, and of course, I immediately put the card down. And acted as if like, no, 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 I just was curious. And that was the first time I recognized and realized that I was different from my other male cousins, friends, things like that at the time. And then um, time went on and then you were able to make some connection with your, your aunt. And uh, this has a very... This story is really powerful for me. Um, tell us how you were able to move forward with your life and how you were get connected with your Aunt Annie and other members of your family. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would, uh, Tavid. My Aunt Annie, yeah, lived in New Jersey. She was the youngest of seven of kids. My mother was the oldest. And to be able to keep connection with that side of the family. Either they would send family out here to Arizona to visit us, or um, we would visit in the summertime for months at a time to be able to connect with our family and keep relations. At 11 years old, I, um, I was asked to walk in my aunt Annie's wedding. Someone I had only remembered meeting maybe once, and I think it was like five or six at the time. Um, not, not much of a recollection for her at all. And so I walked with a cousin of mine in her wedding. And at the time, it was very different for me to see how my cousins reacted to this particular aunt. Um, all of my other aunts and uncles were born in Syria or out of the country. So they had a very Middle Eastern background, um, stern, stoic, not super fun. Um, this aunt, on the other hand, my Aunt Annie, was, you know, all the kids gravitated to her. She was Americanized. She was young. She was fun. Um, and so that was different for me. But I, I was, at, at that age, I was young I was, and I was quiet. I was timid. So I would more so just watch. I would sit back and kind of like analyze the situation. Um, but I connected with her. And, you know, she would take us to movies and pizza and things that the other aunts and uncles really wouldn't do. Um, so a connection started with her when I was about 11 and I was in her wedding. And she um, at that time would have been what, 27? She was, I think, 14 or 15 years older than I was. So, so, so 26, like 26. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then tell me how the connection continued and where. So the next year, I, my parents sent. Uh, my sister and I, my middle sister, Sarah, and myself back out to New Jersey to visit family once again. And um, that's when I, I want to say connection, but just things deepened with her. Uh, the plot thickened and I noticed things that just weren't right. Um, she was 
very physically abusive with other family members or people that she would just see on the street, um, especially her husband. Um, punching, kicking, like scratching of the eyes, like just wow. It sounds crazy, but yeah, that's the whole family would brush it off as, oh, that's Annie. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the first time I got in a car with her after the second time I visited at 12 years old, it was about 20 minutes down the freeway. It was myself in the back seat and her, she was driving, her husband was in the passenger seat and uh, she wasn't too happy with something that he said. So she pulled over and literally kicked him out of the car. She was almost 5'10". She was like five nine and a half, and um, And she kicked him out of the car on the freeway close the door and continued to drive off Mm. um, and looked at back at me and laughed and just said, yeah, that's how you handle a situation. And she even went further to try and train me on how to lie during that, that drive because her husband had questioned her or inquired about something that she wasn't happy about. And she hurt, her first lesson to me was, you know, somebody approaches you about something and you don't want to tell them you just you just deny, deny, deny. You lie and you deny, deny, deny. And that was her. I remember that like like it was verbatim vivid, mm-hmm. like it was yesterday. Deny, deny, deny. So that was like my first. One on one introduction with my aunt, um, which kind of set the tone and the mood. Um, to never go against the grain when it came to being around her or anything that that came up from her. Also, I think your culture also teaches total respect for your elders. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I would use the term respect softly. Um, when we were raised, we were taught you don't talk back. Somebody asks you to do something, especially if they're older than you, you just do it. You don't question, you don't lollygag, you get it done immediately and with respect. And when I say respect, I mean, you know, no comments, no questions, um, not even a huff or a puff. You just do it and you're done. Um, That's how we were raised. So on top of that, you add another, you know, compounding layer of that to my relationship with my aunt. And it was another reason why I never questioned or stood up against things that I saw that I knew inside weren't right. So when you saw her with this much rage, anger, um, what were you thinking at, you were 12 years old at the time, what were you thinking internally? Were, were you creating some fear of her uh, and wanting to just be the quiet boy? You know, it was, it's an ironic feeling actually, because I was so timid and shy to see somebody so outspoken, boisterous and and nasty. There was a side of me that was intrigued because I was, it was a total opposite of who I was. And it was, it was amazing, but not in a good way to see somebody treat other people in an entirely opposite way that I did. You know, if somebody did something wrong to me, I would just take it, I would go off and cry. And, you know, I I would never stand up for myself. And here is this woman that gets a wrong look or not even a wrong look, just a look that she doesn't like for whatever reason from somebody walking in a parking lot at a grocery store and she'll go on the physical attack. Oh. So, you know, it was- Horrible. Ironic is probably the the best term for me to apply there. very scared of her. No question about that. Um, she was a very intimidating woman, but at the same time, intrigued. Mm -hmm. How do people get away with this? And, you know, yeah. So we're going to talk a little further about your situation with Annie, but you realize she had gotten violent so much with her husband, which was Sam, correct? That he had a scar down his chest and you thought it was from an accident, but you found later from your sister when she told you don't stay there that it actually been caused by Annie with a letter opener. And we're going to bring that in a little bit later because I think that then shows this woman is insanely angry. I think in my estimation, mentally ill. Uh, and I think that's that's going to be 
something that we're going to talk about. So how did your situation with Annie continue on to where she got physical with you? Um, so I really enjoyed spending time with my male cousins when I was in New Jersey, especially my older male cousin, Elias. I really looked up to him. He was very masculine and naturally built everything. I wasn't, I was very heavy as a child and, you know, timid and shy, like I said. So he was also very close with Annie. Um, and it came time for us to, you know, we would, we had a lot of family there. So we would all switch nights that we would stay at families' homes and, the night that I decided, or we all decided to stay at Annie's home um, was a night where it was myself, my cousin Joey, my cousin Elias, and a friend of ours that we knew since before we were born. My parents knew them. They had a son named Chris who was about the same age. We all stayed at Annie's house. And I I was made fun of by my cousins a little bit because I was heavy and I was used to wear a shirt. They all, they all slept in their boxers with the shirt off. You know, that was my first introduction to my cousins sleeping at their aunt's house, at our aunt's house that mm -hmm. night. You know, it's let's all go to the living room, throw a blanket on the floor, open up the couch bed, watch a movie, fall asleep in the living room. I got made fun of for not having my shirt on and for, for I'm sorry, for having my shirt on. Um, so they made me take that off. Fine. I was quiet. Um, the thing that really burnt a memory in my mind was the next morning we woke up and the first thing Annie did was she took the blanket and she threw it off of all of us and okay, let's see everybody's morning wood. I had never heard that term before. I didn't know what that was, but the first thing that my cousin, I'll just say one of my cousins did was stand up and, and show off their erection underneath their boxers. Um, my other cousin followed suit. The third did not and just laughed. Um, and I was mortified. I didn't have an erection. I wasn't about to get one. I was terrified to be there shirtless as it was. Ironically, looking up to all these people because they were, they were family, but I didn't know them, but they were so confident in everything that I wasn't. So I guess I kind of, you know, wanted a little bit of that. And, but they all stood up. They, they, two of the, the three showed their erection and, and then made fun of me for not showing mine and for wearing, for having pants on. I didn't, I didn't want to sleep in my boxers. That was weird. Um, so that, that continued, um, every morning we were there. Did, did that I, at that time when she asked this would be her nephews to do this, was that at your time thinking this woman is not normal? This woman is violating physical boundaries of her nephews. Did that, that ever thought a correct? I'm, I'm, I, did, I didn't remember talking about this, but it, it just blows my mind that someone asked someone to show their erection, and that would give me some indication she has some serious, serious problems. And I'm su yeah. surprised your, your nephews went along with that. My cousins, yeah. I, or your cousins, me, right. It was, a, it was a conundrum for me because here I am with family. Like, this is blood. And right. this is my aunt, who I'm getting to know. And these are my cousins, who I'm getting to know. And to them, this was all, this had happened clearly many times before it happened this time. I, I, there we go. That makes sense. So she's, she's done this before with them. With them so remember, yeah. she lived, I, I went to a state where they all lived together. So for them, they knew each other very well. They had spent, they grew up together. I didn't, I moved here when I was born. Mm -hmm. Um, I was born here actually a month after my parents moved here. I was born from New Jersey. So I didn't know these cousins. I didn't know this aunt other than when I would see them for a very short time when they would visit for a week or a weekend to Arizona. So for me to see this, I thought, okay, it feels very wrong. I'm definitely not, I don't even want to take my shirt off, let alone try and get an erection in front of my aunt and my cousins. But they're all having fun. And to them, this is a, this is a normal occurrence. Clearly, this has happened many times before. So like I said, for me, it was a conundrum. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Um, and of course, I wasn't Growing up Middle Eastern, 
I love the culture, don't get me wrong, but we don't communicate. The loudest person in the room wins, everybody else has to shut up, and kids are not allowed to have a voice. So, and therapy wasn't a thing. I, who was I to talk to? I didn't know to talk. I, you know, for me, talking was causing trouble. You're, you're causing drama. Why did you, why did you bring this up? So it's not something I spoke about. I, in the moment, I tried to do what I could to not do what they were doing. But this was clearly normal for them. And this was my new normal when I was there. So this escalated with Annie toward you and got to be, I think, well, let's be, let's just use an honest word here, molestation. Tell us how that happened. Yeah, so it escalated. Um, She, it went from just the morning, the morning wood show to evenings. Um, She would force me to sleep in her bed with her alone. And she would force my cousins and her husband to sleep in the living room without us. And of course, everybody would get upset. Her husband first, even my, my, my cousins, innocently, they didn't know what was going on. They were just like, but we want to spend time with Tavo was my name as a child. That was my nickname. We want to spend time with Tavo. Why can't he sleep here out with, with us? Like he's only visiting for a week or two. Like we want him to spend time with us. Why does he have to sleep in the bed with you? That's weird. Um, and she got physical. The first time that happened, she, I remember she, she tried. She kicked her husband in the balls and she choked him in front of us when we all, I didn't go against her. I just would sit there, but my cousins, her husband, they were, they were furious. And when it escalated to the point where she needed to shut us down, she became the loudest and most physical person in the room. And she made an example out of her husband for all of us to shut down. And we did. So went into her room, stayed the night. Um, It wasn't for about a week later that she forced me to do it again. But there was this, there was like an, extra layer of rage that evening and it was the evening before i was supposed to go home and it didn't feel it felt even more wrong than it had felt the entire trip and again she made a physical example out of her husband i she she grabbed his testicles in front of all of us through his shorts to show us that this is what was going to happen to us if we went up against her and she was punching him. Now he would defend himself. He wouldn't punch back. And they, was, they were yelling. So that was it. Didn't change anything. I was still forced to go in the room with her. This night I chose not to fall asleep. And you were fearful uh, and, 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 and concerned that she's going to do something with you. Because you were what? At this time, 12? 12. And she yeah, was in I her didn't, late twenties. I didn't know why she wanted a monopoly on me at, at night. I it didn't it didn't compute with me. It didn't make sense. I didn't know if it was just a possession thing. Um, I didn't know. So this night was the night before I was meant to go home. Um, she forces her husband, and my sister, to stay in the living room. I go and I stay in the bedroom with her. Of course, she would put me. Her wall was, her bed was up against the wall um, in the corner. And so I was in the corner. So if I ever wanted to crawl out of bed, I had to crawl over her or crawl down the bed to get out. And this night I just couldn't sleep. I, I forced myself to stay awake. Um, I had my back turned against the wall. And I don't know how much detail you'd like me to get into. Um, but... I remember she, she put her hand on my shoulder and um, 
she kind of just gently had me lay on my back. And I faked like I was asleep. I'm sure she had to know I wasn't because you can't, you don't just move somebody like that at night. Maybe, I don't know. And um, her hand went from my shoulder to like my chest. And over time, it would slowly move its way down until she placed it on my on my penis. And, um, and she just let it sit there. And I remember freezing. I can't explain it, but your body just kind of, um, you just feel like you're a board, like you're a wooden board. And she then started moving her hand on me. And this is the part I hate the most. I got an erection. So I remember I started like shaking and um, I started not breathing. And then I jumped out of the bed. I couldn't take it anymore. She was, her hand was moving more and more and I jumped out of bed. I jumped out of the bed and I ran into the bathroom. And I was hoping that if I was just loud enough to make it look like I wasn't trying to be loud and trying to get attention, but just loud enough to wake up her husband, that at least he could fight with her and wake up and see that something is going on. Nobody woke up. I sat in the bathroom. I was there for what seemed like at least 20 minutes. Knock on the door. Hey, Tav, what's the matter? Are you okay? You've been in there a while. I didn't answer her. Knock again. Tav, are you okay? And her rule in that house was we were never allowed to shut the door when we were in the bathroom. Not to shower, not to pee, nothing. So for me to shut that door behind me and lock it, I was mortified that she was going to hurt me when she opened that door. And I finally answered her and I'm like, I just, I'm just using the bathroom. I'll be right out. Nobody woke up. She opened the door. I unlocked the door. She opened the door. I went back to bed. <laughs> Happened again. She put her like she put her hand on me. And I jumped out of the bed and ran in the bathroom again. This time I was loud when I shut the door and her husband woke up. Well, what I wanted happened. They started a fight. They were kicking, punching. They were on the floor wrestling. And my sister woke up. Everybody was yelling and arguing and. And she finally just said, all right, that's it. I'm done. You're, you're, she, she, I, I can't remember exactly what she said, but she went, she grabbed her phone um, and she started calling somebody. We had no idea who she's calling. She was calling the airline. She called the airline. She extended my ticket for a week or two weeks longer and didn't extend my sister's ticket. So that was another argument, didn't turn physical between her and her husband and my sister. My sister was furious. Why are you doing this? My brother needs to come home with me. We have school. He can't stay here. You're, you haven't even asked my parents, how could you do this? And she didn't care. Annie, you did not stand in Annie's way. If you, if you gave her an ultimatum or if you told her not to do something, she would intentionally do it. 10 times worse, just to, to show you never to ask her to do that again. So the next morning, my sister went home. Sam took her to the airport, and I stayed at my aunt's house. D during that time, Tavi, did you know that she was extending it so she would do more harm to you? At that time when you were 12, did you think, oh, my God, this is going to happen again? And that had to make you extremely 
um, I, I would think paralyzed almost. That I was terrified. Did terrified? Yeah. Is that was, how you felt at that time? I was Dan. I was terrified, knowing that my sister, my sister may have been only three years older than me, and she was also kind of timid and shy. But when it came to defending me, she was not quiet. And so to have that shield, that sword, that buffer zone fly home to the other side of the country, I was terrified. So tell us what happened while you stayed there. In other words, more molestation. It continued on. Tell us how that happened. So the next morning, I... I basically waited by the phone. Um, I calculated out how long it was going to take for my sister to get home so that I could call her. And I don't remember if she called me or I called her. I think she called me. And I was, I was, I, I told her, I said, Sarah, I don't, I don't want to be here. I'm scared. I don't want to be here. And she's like, well, what, what's going on? Talk to me. What happened last night? You know, cause they don't know. They still don't know what happened in the room. I just said, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Like, I just want to get out of this house. I don't want, I want to be gone when Andy gets home from work. Cause Andy was at work. Sam and Andy were both went to work at that point. And I said, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, when Andy gets home, I'm going to tell her to just take me to Teresa's house. And, you know, I, I don't want to cause trouble and have somebody come pick me up. I'll just have Annie take me to Teresa's house, which was my other aunt when she gets home. And my sister, Sarah said, you can't, you can't, you can't confront her. You can't talk to her. You can't, you can't, don't do that. And well, why Sarah, why? And my sister said, Tav, I, I just don't want to tell you, but you can't, you just have to get out of that house, call Teresa and go. And I said, Sarah, tell me why. And so she did, she said, she said, Tav, do you know the chest that the, the, the scar that's on Sam's chest? And I said, yes. I said, do you mean the one that he got from like walking, crawling under barbed wire? She goes, yeah, that's not how he got it. She goes, Annie stabbed him with a letter opener. She tried to kill him. You cannot confront her. You need to get out of that house now. I felt all the blood from my body drained my feet. Now, not only am I terrified of what she's going to do to me if I stay here for that night, I'm terrified that if I go against her, she's she going to kill me. She may kill you. Yeah. She's going to kill me. Wow. So I, Sarah was like, hang up with me now. Call Teresa. My aunt Teresa was the closest aunt to us. So I did call my aunt Teresa. I'm trembling. I can't get any words out. Please pick me up. Please pick me up. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Please pick me up. Please pick me up. I just kept repeating. I don't want to be here when Annie gets home. I don't want to be here when Annie gets home. She was like mad at me. Tell me what's going on. What's talk to me. Oh, just come get me. That's just, I begged her, I, please come get me. So my aunt Teresa came and got me, took me to her house. Um, and he called her, you know, Teresa sat me on the counter and tried to get me to, you know, what happened? Nothing. I just don't want to talk about it. I just don't want to go back. I don't want to see Annie. I don't want to go back. Please don't let her come here. I just kept repeating myself over and over and over. So the phone rings at my aunt Teresa's house and it's, it's Annie. And, um, I'm terrified. And my aunt Teresa goes, Annie, I don't know what you did to this kid. I don't know what's happening. All I know is he is trembling. He's crying. He's dripping wet with sweat and he does not want to see you. So I'm telling you right now, whatever happens, we got to get to the bottom of it. And Annie, uh, excuse me, sorry, mm -hmm. Annie, I could hear Annie. Oh my God. What do you mean? What is he, what did he say? Why would he lie? What did he tell you? My aunt Teresa goes, I don't know, but we have to get the, we have to get to the bottom of this. Like, I don't even know why this kid is here. I thought he was supposed to go home last night or this morning. And Annie goes, well, I'm on my way there. I'm going to leave work and I'm on my way there. And Teresa goes, Oh no, you're not. You are not coming here. This kid is terrified. You are not coming to my house. If, if you show up at my house, I'm calling the police on you. Dan, the amount of relief that I had listening to my aunt stand up for me that way, I thought, I thought, okay, thank God I am finally going to get out of this situation that I've allowed myself to get in. And that wasn't the case at all. Hmm. Uh, about a half hour later, the doorbell rings. My aunt Teresa tells me it's my cousin Angela coming home from school. Go get the door. I go get the door. I open up the first door and then there's a 
screen door and it's Annie. She did the same thing she did to me when I ran into the bathroom. She gets on her knees and she's like fake crying. And what, what did you tell Teresa? Why are you doing this to me? Why? She's telling me not to come here because I'm, uh, you know, uh, she's going to call the police. My aunt Teresa comes running to the door. What are you doing here? I told you not to come here. And the Annie goes, well, look at him. He's fine. He's fine. He's not saying anything. Just ask him, ask him, is it okay if I come in, Tov? It's okay if I come in, right? And she's like grabbing my hand while she's on her knees. It's okay if I come in, right? It's okay. Like, it's fine. I didn't say a word. I didn't say yes. I didn't say no. I just wanted her to leave. But I couldn't speak up for myself. So my Aunt Teresa allows Annie back in. She convinces Annie to allow me to, to go back home with her. And so I did. Go back home with Annie. Back home with Annie. Oh, God. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So in reality, your aunt Teresa didn't protect you. Even though she didn't know what was wrong, she didn't protect you when you were in that state. How did that make you feel when you were put back into this horrible situation again? What were the feelings going on with you, David? It wasn't... It was less of a feeling, more so a lesson that A, speaking up to an adult doesn't help. B, speaking up to an adult makes things worse. Because when I got home or to Annie's house, she tore me down to nothing. She tore me down to nothing. She immediately sat me down and told me the only reason why you are staying at my house and nobody else's is because your family knows that you are gay. They don't want you around any of their children, especially the boys. They don't want you turning their boys gay. The girls are disgusted by you. Your cousins, girls, and your aunts and uncles are disgusted by you. They don't want you around them, them or their, their children. I'm the only one that doesn't have kids. That's why they all told you to stay at my house. So don't ever ask to go anywhere else again. You are staying here until you go home. And she said, you are not to call anybody unless I, I give you permission. You are, not to, you are not to have communication with anybody unless I give you permission. Your aunts and uncles have told me they don't want you around their kids. What a master mentally manipulator mentally ill master manipulator mentally ill master manipulators how would i define that i mean i this is where i get my outrage going on when david told me about this this is the, to me when a child is in this situation we've got to believe that what they're saying take it honestly and openly and honest um and you didn't get the protection at this time. You didn't get the protection. You were thrown back to a mentally ill molester who had no conscience. Anyway, I, I, just, I just think this is heartbreaking to hear you have to go through this. But it continues even longer, doesn't it? 